March, one of Hiles Deacons, A.V. Ballinger, was convicted on charges he molested a seven-year-old girl in Sunday school. A lawsuit by the girl's family charges Hiles told the parents that Deacon Ballinger just likes little girls. If we can judge the world someday, we can judge within ourselves. A.V. Ballinger should not be judged in the courts of Hammond. He should be judged by wise people in First Baptist Church of Hammond, if he's judged at all. I had a real exciting trip in my future. We had discovered the sun was in the sea. I wanted to come to the back. Here, Mr. Governor, we had over here. Let's give Mr. Ethel a hand, shall we? Mr. Ethel, Mr. Ethel was your son of school teacher many, many years ago. I know you're going to hug and say, I'm glad you are to see it. Isn't that something? Oh, it's one of the high hours of all of our history. All that, Mr. Ethel, just that. Tell us what kind of boy he was, things like that. Oh, Wonderful to be with you tonight. Oh. Oh. Well, I was flying here. We sat next to a lady on the plane. Okay, it's good I ever saw. I looked at her and I said, yeah. The little kid looks like a monkey. She said, call the stewardess and all, man. She said, this man has upset me if I might get a monkey. Stewardess said, lady, I'll get your coat, and I'll get your coat, and I'll bring a banana for the monkey. <laughs> hey, that's it, A.B., A.B. boy. Get away, you boy. One of my star people. He was in my primary Sunday school class 91 years ago. Many young boys have gone to my class and become a great success in life. Men like Jesse Jackson, Ted Kennedy. Jim Jones, one of my recent stars, David Quinn. A.B. Ballinger, and Hillary Clinton. There's some of the outstanding students in that boys' class. <laughs> One day we had a safety class and we were teaching them CPR. 
Who in Rome has noticed their work to learn today is their mouth-to-mouth recreation. You'll get that, Matthew. Well, the day, Brother Ballinger looked at Mrs. Ballinger and he said, Honey, your nylons are wrinkled. He said, I ain't wearing them. Oh, really? I was the guy that said, I was the guy that said, you heard me say, he goes after me. But, uh, but I said, here's the good thing. That's when the last year, he was the last year. 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 A real quick story, and this is worth mentioning. I called the Times this week. If any of you were here, I think it was close to 100. Uh, the night that uh, Brother Ballinger was convicted, uh, we gathered around him to help him down the stairs. Now, I've done photography work in the past. I know what photography is going through. There was a Hammond Times photographer that stayed there all day long from 9 o'clock in the morning until I think it was 11, 12 o'clock when we left that night. And they were trying to get a picture of Brother Ballinger as he was leaving. And we all gathered around him, a hundred of us. He was in the middle. I don't think he even knew where he was. And we were going down the stairs, and Jojo Moppy was jumping in front of the photographer, and Don Boyle was jumping in front of the photographer. And he was snapping that camera like crazy, running up and down the stairs trying to get a picture. Well, I called the photographer this week. I know him. His name's John Watkins. Nice guy. And I said, John, I'd like to get some pictures of that night that you took of Brother Ballinger's crime. And he said, uh, well, well, so we can't help you. Well, we can't tell what we don't publish. And I said, well, why, why can't you publish that? Why didn't you publish it? And he said, well, it was too late that night. We couldn't get to the paper. But the honest truth was the reason that they didn't publish it was they didn't know where Brother Ballinger was in that crowd. And that crowd of people around him would have, have been more of a positive story of the friends that were together around him. I wish they could be here tonight to take a picture of the friends that have gathered and to, to come in honor of Brother Ballinger. Your family's at heartache. Absolutely. 
Our families are that large. Obviously, we could do just. I'll put all of them on. Remember them that are in bonds as bound with them. Yes. And them which suffer adversity. Being yourselves also in the body. My Bible says that the adversity that this man is having to endure is to be entertained and born and remembered by every single Christian. We also being in the body. What's happening to this man is happening to my faith. It's happening to my savior. It's happening to my testimony. I am to remember. The word remember there doesn't just mean that I'm supposed to kind of mull it in my mind. It means I'm supposed to identify with. I'm here tonight to tell you that I'm committed to doing some things. And I want to encourage you to do some of these things. You listen to me. First of all, I believe the Bible commands us to identify clearly with those that for doing right are suffering adversity. I see across America Christians that grow shy. Christians that say, boy, I hope it all turns out. I'll pray for you. But they're nowhere to be found when the person's standing in the battle. Thank God this church is not like that at all. Thank God this is a church that steps up with pride and says, and it is an honor to be identified identified with Brother Ballinger I want you to know that this is a man who's worthy of that and this is a Bible that commands us to do that to openly cast our identity then the Bible says not only are we supposed to give our identity with them it says we're supposed to encourage him you know, the Bible doesn't call us to add to each other's burdens, but the Bible calls us to bear one another's burdens. Now, if I've got problems, there's a few people I just soon you not call. Because if I got one problem when you call them, after you call them, I'll have two problems. You know what? Isn't it delightful to know that here's a church that openly identifies identifies with those that are doing right and here's a church that is going to be an encouragement to this good man can I ask you a question tonight if brother Ballinger were just taken out of that seat and you were brought up here To sit in that chair how much encouragement would you like oh you say brother Gibbs if I had to sit there oh I'd want people to identify with me brother Gibbs I'd want them to encourage me I believe the Bible commands it Um, and my abuse started very young and it started um, at the church um, when I was riding a, a bus um, the estimated age I, I estimated was around five um, but um, yeah it happened at the church well not at the church but on the, the bus that carried us to church no it happened on on the transportation ride before see the first Baptist when they used to come and pick the kids up 
they used to send a group of young like ministers out door to door and they'd knock on the door and let you know the bus is coming and some of the children would get picked up sooner than others because they would be ready to go and I was one of them and I would stay on the bus with the bus driver which at the time when I was being molested was the bus driver but then later ended up being the deacon of the church mm -hmm. it was um the inappropriate touching and um you know it was um I didn't know it was wrong you know I was so young I just thought it was love and um so I just figured you know all the little extra things that you know I would get and because I was always first on the bus and always revved up to go you know I'm like yeah we're going and I'm gonna get the extra goldfish today and I'm gonna but I didn't know that maybe some of that stuff was tied to him and his favor but because he was abusing me probably about when I was around probably around 11 you know is when I started realizing you know something was wrong mm -hmm. um, when I truly realized that I needed to talk about it I was like 18 mm -hmm. and um, me and my girlfriend who was also a victim uh, but she was being molested in her own home by one of her parents she was telling me you know, and I was, you know, trying to console her that, you know, it's okay, you're not the only one, you know, it's, you know, okay, you know. I couldn't say how many times it happened because it was, you know, a lot of times, but I couldn't say that it was so much that it was, like I said, I didn't even know it was wrong. <laughs> you know, yeah. it was just, um, you know, I thought this was some kind of special love, you know, that he loves me more than you guys. and. You know, and I had no idea that, you know, this touching was inappropriate until, you know, when you get older and you see other people getting caught kissing and getting caught doing things and then you start realizing, hey, something ain't right. That happened to me when I was younger and this was a big person and, and it kind of, you know, that's when you start trying to figure it and then you became, you become ashamed. Mm -hmm. And then if you were active like I was who had a other issues and because I was black and white and my family already had the vision um, it also made me think that there was something wrong with me I already thought something was wrong with me because I was black and white you know yeah. the world was nice in the 70s about that issue so on top of that and then this I really as a young child felt really obligated to be quiet and um, know that uh, whatever I had done it was probably my fault that I you know it happened and uh, it took me many years of uh, a lot of things I went through and then it's establishing a relationship with God to truly be able to get past this and understand. Even as a child, um, I knew God, you know, and, and I, I, you know, though it happened to me at that church and, and there was things that happened, there were a lot of beautiful people at that church. And um, this was just one bad man in that church. And, and I felt some type of way with my family. And they didn't even know. I don't even think they know to this day that I felt some type of way. I felt like, um, you know, like, um, like they should have saved me. I mean, but how can anyone save you if they don't know? And then when some found out, I felt like they should have reacted in a better way. And this is such a sensitive issue. No one wants to talk about it because you know, it's it's nothing no one wants to really hear. It's awful, you know. Mm -hmm. But at the same token, it's happening so much that it needs to be addressed. I was in college at uh, Cadena College of St. Joseph's, and um, we had a teacher there, and he used to talk about cases that were coming up um, for trial and, and things that were going on. And he was talking to me about, well, it wasn't just me, it was the whole class. Uh, about a case and the particulars and they sounded so familiar and for years I had asked God for a sign to tell you know how should I tell what they believe me you know and um, we got in class and um, I was like I said I was maybe 22 and he starts talking about this man and this case and it sounded so familiar and I was like and they were talking about how he might go free because there was no witnesses to to this man you know and and I'm like man that's awful and I'm hearing the story and after class I walk up to the teacher because they never tell us the names of the people that they're talking about they just address the the case but not the people so 
So after the class, I was like, hey, let me ask him, you know, maybe this is my sign. So I walked up to the teacher and I says, uh, can I ask you a question? And I just said, well, I just wanted to know what's that man's name, Ballinger. And he says, were well, you going to ask me the same thing to the other girl? And she says, no, I want to know about the syllabus. And he says, no, we're going to have to talk later. I need to talk to her right now. So he says to me, hey, how did you know that? And then I got nervous a little bit. And he was like, wait a minute, Ari, right, if you're nervous, you know, maybe I can let you talk to someone else. But I'm just curious to how did you know, you know, and I'm like, no, I'm fine. He was, you know, really nice about it. Like, how did you know? And, and I was like, well, it just it seems similar, you know, to, to my thing. And so, you know, he was like, well, do you feel comfortable talking to me? And I was like, sure, because I felt like I was an adult woman now. Yeah. You know, I mean. You had he, a kid at this point, right? Yeah, that was three. And I, I think the young girl that um, was going through this at the time was around that age. So then I felt guilty because I felt like all these years I've held this in. Now there's a child who's the same age as mine going through this, if I would have said something, if I would have did something, you know, I began to take on more guilt and more, you know, shame and more, and um, it was like, I got, I got through it though, you know, he says, hey, can you, would you be willing to testify, and at this point, this was my, what do you want to say, my, not my get back, but my chance to, you know, make the wrong right, you know, and Though I hadn't done nothing wrong, I took on, you know, feeling wrong for this child, you know, and for her parents. And and so I was like, you know, I got to do what's right here. And so I, I, I went to the, the, the Crown Point and um, I gave my deposition. Upon getting there, I had no idea that he was going to be there. They didn't tell me accusers have the right to face their, uh, I mean, yeah, the, the accuser, the accused have the right to face your accuser so I was like okay and so I was a little nervous but I, I got through it that and I did the I um, noticed through articles that after I came forward there were many others mm -hmm. and so I don't know if I started something then by coming forward or if someone else had came forward I, I don't know I just know that it was many of us after this that came forward and I felt like finally there's going to be some justice, and there was. I felt, I felt good that he was finally going to um, pay for some of his wrongs. You know, um, I also felt bad. I felt bad for him as well, but it wasn't right away. It was many years later because as you start watching that, a lot of times victims are people who later become perpetrators and um, especially in a lot of young men and, and boys you know and not that women don't I mean there are but then I started feeling bad for him in, in the instance that you know maybe he had been through something so tragic himself that made him this way or um, you know maybe there was you know something I had compassion and I, I know that that compassion I had, it, it came from God, the same compassion that he has on us when we do wrong. And, um, you know, it took me a long time to forgive him. Um, I learned later how to forgive and, and it's, I've taken therapies and different things and it didn't take away the memories. But when I got my relationship with God, thank God for it, <laughs> it changed. Um, it was so important to me to have this relationship with Christ Jesus because when I had this relationship, it changed a lot about me. I had a, a, a new conviction in my heart for forgiveness and, and not just for him, but I want to be forgiven, so I have to, you know, be forgiving. And so it, it was, it's, it's a daily battle. And if I would have came forward sooner, there may have been less victims. So if I can just help save one, it's worth it.